Perfect. <clears throat> so thank you very much. Thank you very much, thank Jack and, and uh, Lisa and all the committee who has organized the meeting. It's really a pleasure to be here. And of course, Fran, for the, for the introduction. Uh, as Fran mentioned, uh, having the contact with the patient associations is so important. I think there are many things that, as physicians, we don't know about the rare diseases that uh, we are experiencing in this group. And so we do, it's a win-win situation, information that goes back and forth. That's what I'm <clears throat> learning also uh, as my wife is running our, coordinating our vascular anomalies clinic in Brussels. So she's more in the clinical side and I'm try, uh, running the, the diagnostic or the uh, genetic lab. And we all the time try to share as much as possible the research results directly into the clinic and try to get information from the clinic so that it advances even faster. So I think this, all these kind of interactions are really beneficial for, for all of us. So I was not not quite sure uh, when I was asked to talk about the structure and function of the lymphatic system that what should I exactly uh, discuss. So we'll see how this goes. I tried to put some slides on, on the basic sides of the lymphatic system and then a little bit of the genetics um, at the end. So what does the lymphatic system actually uh, <clears throat> consist of? Just to have kind of a, a general overview or understanding what, what this is about. I don't know if the pointer, no, we don't see it on the screen. Um, <clears throat> but so we have, of course, the vascular so the system, the heart and the whole vascular system, the red in the arteries, blue in veins. In addition to that, we have the system in green, which is the lymphatic system. And that's what we are basically interested about here today. And that system, in a sense, starts, if one looks at the periphery of the, of the body, from these lymphatic capillaries, and you can see it's a, there's kind of a dead end, or actually it's the beginning. Um, I can't really point, or here. This is kind of the beginning of the lymphatic system. That's where the lymph will be uh, taken up by the lymphatic capillaries. And then these get into a bigger and bigger uh, rivers. Well, we call, call them collecting lymphatic vessels. And uh, these go through, the, the lymph goes through the lymph nodes. Ah, that's when you can see. Perfect. So now I have two. Uh, <laughs> so then the lymph goes, passes through also the lymph nodes. We are perhaps not that much uh, talking about that. Uh, but of course, this is the immune immunosurveillance system, um, also for cancers and infections. And ah, it's this one. And then the lymphatic vessels uh, connect into the veins, and there are some specific valves here so that the lymphatic liquid can go back to the uh, vascular system. So right here. And so these uh, peripheral lymphatics are being uh, made into bigger and bigger uh, trunks. We can anatomically uh, already uh, identify certain trunks. And then at the end, we have this big thoracic duct and the right lymphatic duct. And you can see here where they then uh, uh, the flow of the lymph goes back into the venous system. And of course, many of the so-called central con conducting lymphatic anomalies, we think, have something to do with the thoracic duct and these big, bigger uh, trunks of the lymphatic system. So how is this lymphatic system then built? I mean, we are there discussing what we have at the end. Where does it come from? Well, the whole system actually during the development starts from the, uh, what is called vascular genesis and angiogenesis. We first build up the vascular system and the lymphatic system comes then a bit later on on top of that. And so when we start from one single cell, of course, each one of us, those cells divide and divide and divide and then they start to specialize, they start to differentiate. And in that cell mass, there are certain cells that then uh, accumulate, they aggregate, and they create these blood islands, they are called. They start to fuse, and then you start to have this kind of a primary capillary plexus, a, a very primitive plexus where we can already see that there are tunnels, so they, are, they might be able to uh, uh, contain blood and flow. And then uh, <clears throat> these structures with angioplasts develop the arteries and the veins and the capillary plexus that becomes from here. So this now has the system with the heart developing separately also in the system to be able to carry out the uh, uh, arterial blood into the capillary system 
and then back via the veins into the heart. But where's the lymphatic system? Well, it will be created, intermingled with the capillary plexus, and it is uh, actually built from the lymphatics. And more specifically, we create this kind of a, this is already has been uh, studied in 1902, this was published, and everybody still refers to this uh, fantastic paper showing that the primitive, the first lymphatic sacs, there's kind of a, a whole bunch of them together that are developed in the embryo, and then there's an over, uh, 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 proliferative growth out from these sacs, and that what then creates the whole lymphatic system. And in addition to that, very recently, it was shown that actually, especially in the skin, the lymphatic vessels don't necessarily come from the veins, but there are also cells we call in situ in the skin. It's these uh, purple cells here that actually can connect with the lymphatic system that is developing in green. And as you can see, they take part of it and they help the system to grow. So they don't come, these cells do not come from the venous part, they are somewhere in the, in the developing skin and they participate into the development of the lymphatic system. So when uh, uh, this system is developed, uh, how does it function? What is its role? Why do we have this system? Do we really need it? Well, we definitely do. It's more or less known that we, all of us, we have about five liters of blood. That's why if you have a lot of bleeding, there's not that much that you can lose because the whole volume is five liters. On the other hand, we have 20 liters of liquid, in a sense, coming out from the capillary system each day. Because the blood volume goes around your body uh, with a quite uh, good speed, 20 liters goes out. But the capillaries actually resorb the majority of this liquid that goes into the tissue, 17 out of the 20 liters. But there's three liters left in the tissues that the capillaries are unable to get, take back into the blood vascular system. And that's what the lymphatics do. They resorb this liquid and put it back into the venous system with the trunks that I just explained. So very important, and of course we know if this doesn't work, uh, function, what happens? So here you have again the, the primary lymphatics. You have these endothelial cells, they are called, and they, have, they, have, they can open the, the connections between endothelial cells. They have a specific name. And so the liquid can enter into these primary lymphatics and then start going back the trunks towards the venous system. And if this does not function, of course the liquid stays in the tissue and we can have, for example, lymphedema, uh, and especially lymphedema that then uh, is generated. Of course, this can also be a problem of the conducting lymphatics that don't are not able to, to conduct the lymph into the venous system, and again, there will be more interstitial liquid that remains in the peripheral tissues. The lymphatic system does not only uh, function in the skin and in the peripheral system, it's also extremely important in the gastrointestinal tract, because these uh, lacteals, the lymph specific lymphatic vessels in the intestine, are able to take up bigger molecules from uh, the gut uh, contents than the capillaries. And those are packed into chylomicrons, and that is why the lymph in the gut actually is white and is called chyle. And this chyle also is put back into the bloodstream via uh, um, the thoracic duct, and it enters into the venous system. But so if we have problems where we see chyle rather than lymph, we know that there must be an intestinal origin of the liquid. So how is all this orchestrated? How to build up this system? Uh, it can't be just by, by chance that all this uh, is able to develop during uh, embryogenesis. Here you actually have a vein in the embryo at day nine. And actually, there are several factors that are very well um, uh, timely and uh, space specifically expressed. They are present in certain areas at certain time point, 
and it's a sequence of different proteins that makes the whole system to develop. And what is called specification is that in this venous system, there are some cells here in green that become specified into becoming lymphatic endothelial cells. And underneath, you can see some strange abbreviations. These are the names of the proteins, the factors that are involved. And you can see that the number of them uh, becomes more and more important. Some of them, they are expressed and then they disappear. They, are, they may be very time spe specifically important. Then these specified endothelial cells by other factors, especially the VEGFC, VEGFR3 signaling pathway, start to proliferate and migrate and try, start to develop these uh, uh, small lymphatic uh, sprouts from the venous system. And later on, the sacs that I showed in the embryo will be developed. Again, other factors, more and more factors that are important for this further development of the system. There's a separation of the lymphatic and the venous system. Of course, that also has to occur. And only the lymphovenous connection, where the lymph goes back to the venous system, will remain. And then <clears throat> we have the sprouting of the whole tree. The ligand for the VGFR3 is very important. And I'll come back to this at the end of the talk, the VGF3, VGFC. And then we have the lymph vascular genesis, which I already mentioned, that there are cells, especially in the skin, that are able to connect into the system and help proliferate and further develop the lymphatic system. But as you can see, many factors that are involved. And then in the maturation of the system, when we get the conducting channels, which have these specific valves, which have some smooth muscle cells on them, also need some other factors. So you can already see that it's not a simple process. It's a very well orchestrated interaction with many factors. And of course, if some of these interactions go wrong, one can imagine that the lymphatic system does not develop or does not function normally. But at the end, basically, we should have this system that covers, in addition to the blood vascular system and the neural system, the whole body, the different parts the different organs uh, of our body. And I think nowadays we should start putting a little bit more lymphatics also in the brain, as that has now more recently been discovered, that the lymphatic system also is present actually in the brain. So what then causes lymphatic diseases? What is known now? I'm not going to go through everything, but I am a geneticist, as Francine Bly already mentioned, and uh, we know that there are so many factors guiding the development of this system. And in addition, we know that there are families where there is a predisposition to developing, for example, lymphedema. On the other hand, we nowadays also know that mutations that are only in tissue, not necessarily inherited, can cause various kinds of vascular anomalies. So it's fairly evident that also in the lymphatic field, we should have these kind of genetic mutations. Nowadays, you always hear about whole exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, RNA sequencing, or targeted sequencing. This is a technology that came about, uh, about 10 years ago. It started slowly and now is everywhere. And this has really completely changed the possibilities that we have to study whatever kind of a disease where we think that there could be a genetic change that predisposes to that disease, or even causes that disease. It's not simple. I'm just showing this to make you realize why it does not always go that fast uh, forward. If we do exome, your exome, my exome, exome means only the genes, not the other parts. Exome is 2% of the human genome. Each individual will have about 30 to 60,000 variants compared to a reference. So you're different from your neighbor, actually, uh, 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 in several sites of your gene. So what we need to do then is to use bioinformatics tools to try to take out of all those variants the ones that are not of interest to us, try to limit the variants that we would really need to study. Of course, this is a technology that makes errors. We can take those out. Great, perhaps 5,000 
go, are gone uh, with that filtering. Then we remove those that the technology also calls to us, but which are not really in the parts that are of interest to us. And that often changes, limits the number a lot. Then we also remove, but here it becomes a little bit more tricky already, we remove variants that we consider as normal variants in the human species. Variants that we know in databases many people have. So since we are looking for dis dis genes for rare diseases, we don't think that it would be the common variants that can cause them. But of course there might be interactions and so we might not be 100% correct in that assumption. And then we start to annotate those that are left using all the information in the medical and biomedical literature and all kinds of prediction programs to try to say which ones are likely to alter the fun function of a certain factor. And that way we start to get about 100 to 500 private, more or less private variants for each individual. But so we still have up to 500 variants and it's perhaps one of them, only one of them, that truly is linked to the disease pathogenesis. So you often we then want to have several individuals and if many of them, or at least some of them, have changes in exactly the same gene, then we might think that, okay, this gene might now then be the cause of the disease. And of course, we then go on with functional studies in cells and in animal models to try to prove that those changes alter the function of the protein and are able to cause the disease. Oops, what happened there? And so with this, <clears throat> actually several genes have been identified that are mutated in uh, lymphatic disorders, mostly in primary lymphedema. I already mentioned the VGFR3 and VEGFC when I showed the factors that are important for the development of the lymphatic system. So this is actually one cell here. This is the membrane of the cell. Here's the nucleus of the, of the cell. All the genome is here, so they can uh, express genes. And this is a receptor on the membrane. So it takes information from outside the cell and brings it into the cell. And so mutations have been identified in the ligand VGFC in primary lymphedema and in the receptor VGFR3. This is one of the most common, commonly uh, mutated genes is the VGFR3. In addition to additional molecules closely linked to this functional uh, unit. Also, these proteins have been identified to be mutated in other phenotypes with the lymphatic component. So these are signaling pathway molecules. So this is the signaling pathway from the receptor. And then we get into the nucleus, where we have transcription factors. And interestingly, there are also several, GATA2, FOXC2, SOX18, that have been also linked to primary lymphedema. So all of the proteins in red. And these genes, some of them actually transcribe the receptor itself, another one, uh, KIF-11, and then other targets are proteins that are very important in the valves in the conducting lymphatic channels. So there is kind of uh, logic in this that we are seeing proteins in the same signaling pathway which is regulating those functions that are so important for the development of the lymphatic system and for the function of the lymphatic system. There's also another signaling pathway that has already been shown in some patients, this one, and we have not yet uh, published, but we have mutations now in HGF, the hepatocyte growth factor, and so it seems that we would have another signaling cascade next to the VGFR3 that is also very important uh, for the lymphatic development and function. So you can see already how many proteins there are, how many uh, red proteins are ma marked. You can see the heterogeneity that there is. Primary lymphedema is not caused by a single gene, but we can see more than 20 genes are implicated. And just to show that sometimes this is very private, this is one family from the United States and they gave their consent also to publish and show the, the images. A couple, neither one is, has any signs of lymphedema, with two children which had both severe lymphedema. Actually, bilateral and even the face, the hands are affected, 
and the younger brother, same situation, bilateral lymphedema, and the face also uh, affected. And they also had protein-losing enteropathy. It seems that very unlikely that this would be uh, a de novo mutation because there are two children, but it could be a de novo mutation in the father or the mother in the germline, and thus the, pa the parent would not be affected, but is able to give uh, the disease to two children. But it is also uh, possible that it could be a recessive disease, meaning that, uh, sorry, that's my daughter, um, that, the recess, that it could be a recessive disease, that uh, the disease comes from the father and the mother. And when we did the filtering that I showed you earlier, if we this, take this as a hypothesis, there was only one gene that could fit that hypothesis. And actually, there is one variant that the father gives to both children, and the mother has another variant in the same gene, and she gives that to both of the children. And only when you have two variants, both copies of the gene that are affected, you actually develop the disease, whereas the parents, as they only have one variant, they do not have the disease. They are just carriers of a recessive disease. We showed then in the, uh, uh, many functional studies that actually this causes a loss of function of ADAMTS3, and this is the cause of the disease. And interestingly, this protein is also very important for VGF R3 signaling. So it fits perfectly with the same pathway. So it seems that this is the pathway that we should think about when looking for future treatments, molecular treatments for lymphedema. And you can see that now we can have a diagnosis, genetic diagnosis to something like 20-25% of primary lymphedema patients. You can see this started 2000, so 18 years ago. We have finding more and more genes, but often it's fairly uh, uh, small the number of families that would have the same gene affected. And that makes it difficult to identify these genes. But as it is the same or similar pathway, it might be that the future drugs would still be common to many of the families. What is already possible is to do genetic screening. This is the panel that we use in, in Belgium. Uh, well, it's, it's available to any uh, hospital or any clinician. And we basically screen all the known lymphedema genes at once. So at least the person will know, is it any of those genes or not? Am I in the 25% category or the 75% category? So how about the sporadically occurring vascular anomalies such as lymphatic malformation, GLA, GSD? Nine years ago, only nine years ago, we published that venous malformations are due to somatic mutations. And that opened the era to look for somatic mutations in vascular anomalies and in any developmental disease. And what was evident to us was that the red peak that you see here is much smaller than the green peak, and this is the normal copy of the gene, and this is the abnormal. You can see that the abnormal is much smaller, so there's much less, it's in fewer numbers than the normal copy of the gene in the tissue. So it's very heterogeneous. And so, most likely in the tissue, there will be uh, normal endothelial cells, mutant endothelial cells, and normal other types of cells. And so, it's not always easy to find these somatic mutations. So, somatic meaning only in the affected tissue. Luckily, we have the next generation sequencing, and especially the targeted NGS that I mentioned, which is very, very sensitive. It's not like the techniques 20 years ago, the Sanger sequencing, you had to have at least 10% or 20% of mutant alleles. With the targeted NGS, we can detect a 1% and even below 1% uh, mutant allele frequency. And so, for example, in lymphatic malformations, it is now well known that we have, in the majority of patients, a mutation in a gene called PIK3CA. They are 
hotspot mutations, meaning that they are almost always one of these recurrent mutations. One of these five or one of these two. Seven five. We have screened uh, 72 patients, samples, tissues that have been resected for treatment, and in 71% of those, we have identified a PIK3CA mutation. So there's still a 30% uh, or 25% of the patients where we have not found, but it could be that the tissue that we had was very small, or it was so heterogeneous, more wild-type cells than abnormal cells that we just couldn't find it. But clearly, lymphatic malformations are due to PIK3CA mutations. And these are same mutations as are seen in some cancers, where the good sign of that is that then we can use drugs that have been developed for the cancer field also for these lymphatic malformations and perhaps other vascular anomalies. And 